So, Peter, can you? There he is. Good morning. Yep. Good morning, James. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, so it's going to be quite interesting, I think. So, um, as usual, do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about the BMO Managed Portfolio and um, how it works and what it's trying to achieve, please? Okay. It's um, it's a fund of investment trusts. It was listed in April 2008, um, which was, in hindsight, not great timing, just before the financial crash. Um, it is a fund that has two portfolios. It has an income portfolio and a growth portfolio, although they're quite separate, um, except for one um, small feature, which I'll come on to in, in a minute. Um, and the shareholders are entirely retail. There's no institutions, there's no private wealth managers, none. And um, when we launched in 2008, we had about 2000 shareholders, all of whom came from kind of old share plans that actually were first came into being in the ivory and sign days in the late 1990s. Um, and now we've grown from 40 million of assets to 185 million of assets and 15,000 shareholders, which is um, quite a lot. So a lot of very small shareholders who are interested in, in the trust. Um, and the, uh, the performance has been um, quite good, particularly in recent years. Um, we keep the share price um, as close to asset value as possible. In fact, it's mainly traded at a small premium for really a very long time now, which enables us to um, issue shares when some demand comes through. And actually, in the last five or six years, we've issued about 45 million pounds of shares, but all in small lots, just in response to demand. Um, I've got a very long-term investment approach. Portfolio turnover is really low. It's 8% for the last three years. So it, it really is quite low. Um, and there's a conversion facility between the income and the growth shares, which can be done um, once a year, actually, in, in the autumn. So it's coming up, should people wish to switch between growth and income with kind of no adverse tax implications. So in a nutshell, that's it. I mean, a fund of investment trusts, when I started doing this, I thought it probably wouldn't prove very popular with particularly with the private wealth manager audience who are core for investment trusts. Um, and I really didn't expect this to last very long. Um, and if we needed to just continually buy in shares to prevent it going from a discount, then we would do that and perhaps have to wind it up. But actually what's happened has been the reverse. It's grown steadily. And uh, as I say, the performance has been quite decent. Um, I think you've shown the performance there over the since launch. The growth portfolio has outperformed the all share for the last nine consecutive years. And the income portfolio of the 13 years has only underperformed the all share twice. So that's quite decent. And because I'm focused on really thinking of it as a long-term savings vehicle for individuals, um, there's lots of ISAs in there. The growth portfolio, lots of child trust funds and junior ISAs and people putting, you know, taking out these products for their children or grandchildren. The income portfolio, let's say, has a more mature um, uh, age profile to the share re register, um, but but hopefully they've also done done reasonably well. So you can see there um, from the numbers, and the past year has, well, past couple of years actually have been very strong in relation to. Um, to our benchmark, which is the FT All Share Index. Um, you're showing there just some details on the income portfolio. Um, I've got there the yield on the All Share and the yield on government bonds. And the Managed Portfolio Trust 
um, yields about 4.4%. Um, the first two or three years of our existence, we were did our best to maintain the dividend um, in a difficult time for, for dividends generally in the UK. Um, but since about 2011, we managed to steadily grow it. We actually grew it also last year, um, year being year to end May. So it's a rather unusual financial year, but that's a year to um, 31st May 2021. And more importantly, uh, we didn't dip into reserves. We covered that with earnings. It's been earnings have covered dividends every year. Um, and most recently, we pay dividends quarterly. That looks like a rather large dividend increase. The board want to kind of even out the uh, size of the quarterly dividends. The, the fourth quarter dividend was getting quite a bit larger than the other three. So, um, you know, they're trying to even things out a bit for the next year. But the outlook for the for, 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 for the dividends from the portfolio is really quite, quite good. Um, it has been helped by, I referred earlier to an unusual feature um, that I think is unique in investment trusts. Um, we have a growth pool and an income pool. And in very broad terms, the gross yield of the income portfolio from when we launched in 2008 right through to um, current um, times has been around about 4%. And the yield of the growth portfolio, obviously investment trusts focus very much on capital growth, but I do get some dividend income and it roughly yields about 1%. And what we do with the yield on the growth portfolio or the revenue generated by the growth portfolio is it gets transferred across to the income portfolio. And at the same time, the same amount gets transferred back from the income portfolio to the growth portfolio. Growth portfolio does not pay a dividend and never will. So that slightly boosts the NAV of the growth portfolio by about 1% over the course of a year, which you probably wouldn't notice, to be honest. For the income portfolio, this particular feature has been a massive benefit um, over the years because that extra 1% of um, effectively dividend yields, which takes us to a gross 5%, once you then take off all the costs, it comes down to roughly 4%, has meant I've never had to chase dividend yield. I can invest in companies, mainly equity income companies, but some alternatives and some other investment trusts too, just purely on the basis of their characteristics and hopefully better prospects. I don't have to go up the yield spectrum, which can be quite risky. Um, and you can sometimes come a bit of a cropper sometimes with apparently very high dividend yields, which suddenly disappear. Never had to do that. And so the income performance of the income portfolio has, as we referred earlier, been decent. And we've had 10 years of consecutive uh, dividend increases now. So that's interesting. It's different. It's slight. It doesn't contort things or bias things hugely. It just slightly benefits the income side of the income portfolio and slightly benefits the capital growth prospects of the growth portfolio. Oh, Dallas has one question. I think was here. Is, is are you a dividend hero? I don't think you are yet. So I think. But I think there's a sort of the AIC has a next generation list. If you've done ten years. Well, James, hot off the press, we are now a next generation dividend hero yeah, of the AIC because we've because we only announced the dividend, the final dividend in mid July. It's only just happened. So, uh, yes, we've managed to get that exalted status. So, so what we're saying here, effectively, is the income pool paying some of its dividend out of capital from this? Well, it's not, the, the answer is no. I mean, the, 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 the earnings per share last year, I think from memory was something like 6.3 or 6.4p. Okay. And it was above the dividend in 2022. So we've not had to dip into reserves. Um, however, there are some 
individual holdings in the income portfolio who do pay their dividends from capital. Mm -hmm. And so um, that I've found has been quite helpful and interestingly has allowed an income portfolio to gain exposure to sectors of the market that you would never expect to see a dividend fund involved in. For example, healthcare and biotechnology, private equity, um, and both of which have had good capital performance. But if you can get some dividends from um, some trusts there, uh, well, you've got the top 10, you see the, 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 the biggest two holdings, BB Healthcare, and a Swiss company, HBM Healthcare, which is a huge trust, it's over a, a billion euros in size, and they pay um, part of their dividends from capital, roughly 3%. And so that affords me exposure to an area I think will give exciting total return, mainly in the form of capital, but also um, it's, uh, it allows us to, you know, help pay the dividend. We've got a third one that's just outside the top 10 called BB Biotech. So it's actually three of them and that accounts for nearly 10% of, um, of the income portfolio. And you'll see in the top 10, there are two private equity trusts, Princess Private Equity and NB Private Equity. And NB Private Equity Partners has been doing really well in the last um, year or so, um, tremendous performance. And they also pay some of their dividends from capital. So um, it, it helps. The vast majority of holdings just are conventional dividend funds. Um, but uh, in the case of healthcare, biotech and private equity, I think adds an interesting twist to an income portfolio and has certainly enhanced the total return. Cool. I mean, actually, you mentioned there's a couple of Swiss ones in there. So, so you can go anywhere in the world to buy closed end funds. Yes, right? as long as long as it's on a recognised stock exchange and it's a closed end listed company. And um, the two I've got are two huge. I mean, BB Biotech is three billion in size, and HBM Healthcare is actually, I think it's about a billion and a half. So they are huge companies, and they've been run for some time. Um, but they are, they've got a lot of resource behind them and they're experts in the biotech healthcare field and they've performed very well. So um, d delighted to have them in the portfolio. Good stuff, all right. Um, let's have a look at the, I'll bring up the, there's the growth portfolio. Now, as you said, I mean, this, this did amazingly well last year. Um, how is um, yeah. that? portfolio evolving as you go through um, 2021? Yes, well, it's it's had a great run actually for a few years now. And you can see, if you just glance your eye down some of the top names, um, some Bailey Gifford trusts in there and two big technology trusts, Alliance Technology and, and Polar Capital. And they have been absolutely in the sweet spot for um, the tremendous run that the technology shares have had. Scottish Mortgage too. I mean, it continues right up to now to be an outstanding performer. And it's, you know, it's 20 billion in size. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. And all credit to um, James Anderson and Tom Slater of Bailey Gifford and, and, and what they've been doing. But yes, James, it's very... It has been very growth and technology orientated, um, also healthcare and biotech features in there, but even HG Capital Private Equity Trust, which has done really well, um, and Chrysalis Investments too, which is a reasonably recent holding, only had it for a couple of years, only been listed a couple of years. Again, there's a big emphasis on technology, software, digital disruptors, um, in their portfolios and they have performed really well. Now, you did kind of hint there that um, they've not done quite so well um, really since the announcement of the vaccines for COVID in November, um, that heralded a change of leadership in stock markets generally, um, UK, US, um, from um, these types of growth orientated, secular growth trusts, technology and the likes 
much more towards value oriented investments from more traditional sectors and companies, oils, banks, industrials, retailers, leisure and, and the likes. Um, and that went moved quite strongly for about six months to the end of May. And then it kind of paused and uh, bond yields stopped going up and we weren't quite sure what was happening. And some of these holdings that you see here have started performing quite strongly again. Um, but I do think looking at a sort of the macro view that the value orientated um, markets, sectors and companies are well placed for the next year or two, because I do think inflation will be more of an issue. I think you'll see bond yields going up and I think eventually interest rates will rise up too. And so um, what I have been doing, and you can see in the top 10 there, um, Fidelity Special Values, which is a UK trust with a value approach, super fund manager, um, Alex Wright, who's done extremely well. Um, since really since the vaccine announcement in November, my main strategy has been to steadily increase holdings um, in trusts, I think, that will benefit from the type of environment I was um, trying to outline there. And I think the UK market, um, but also some UK trusts are very well placed to benefit. I like trusts that have got a domestic orientation to their portfolio, um, a lot of mid and small caps in there. And I think um, they're good value, but they're also experiencing strong profits and earnings growth from the underlying holdings. And um, so although they've kind of paused over the summer, I think it's a pause and I suspect, I don't know when, hopefully sometime in the autumn, um, you will start to see leaderships within markets move back towards these types of companies. Um, and it's, uh, you know, value has been out of favor for a very long time, but I think gradually we'll come back into favor. And uh, in terms of activity within the portfolios, uh, that's what I've been doing is adding to um, UK trusts th this year. And um, I think the next logical step may be to take some money out of these um, technology growth trusts. I've not done that yet, but I suspect I will be at some point in the next six, nine months or so. OK, um, just to get some questions answered, otherwise I'll just be... Talk, me talking all the time. Um, do you have a favourite out of Anyan's technology and polar cap technology? Well, they're, they're both, it's very difficult. I mean, Allianz has, over the long term, performed slightly better, but they are both great. I, I feel polar cap is, uh, you know, is more exposed to some of the mega technology companies that we all know and love or hate, Alphabet, Facebook, etc. And Allianz Technology is run from San Francisco. And I think because of its location, they get to meet some of the newer, smaller tech companies. So you tend to find more mid-size names, mid-size, probably 20, 30 billion in market cap, but much smaller um, than your, um, you know, Microsoft or Apple. And uh, I think they have a unique exposure there. So. Honestly, um, if you had to pick one, I don't think it really matters. Um, so that's my view there. Cool. Um, just something more big picture. How do, how do you actually put the portfolio together? Is there kind of an asset allocation model behind it? Or, um, or what, what, well, what I do. The... I, I do. I mean, I, I work with, um, with, with BMO and I sit in the... Um, sort of monthly asset allocation global strategy meetings, um, which are attended by a number of fund managers. And from that, I can garner views on fixed interests and bonds on currencies and whether we like the Japanese market or the European market or whatever. And um, I do t try and translate that into the portfolio. Uh, well, actually, more importantly, I don't want to go launching off buying trusts in a particular um, geographic area 
um, only to find that we are officially underweighting that um, from, from BMO. So, um, but from that, it really helps set a framework. Um, and actually, the UK, I think, comes out really well just now. It's, um, you know, it's, it's underperformed relatively massively since 2016 and the, and the Brexit vote. But it is just coming back into fashion. In that period when value stocks were leading, um, James, the UK was amongst the best performing of international markets. So, so that's why I'm quite keen. You see there some of the purchases. All of these holdings um, I, I had in the portfolio, just much further down the list. So although you think, oh, it's a technology growth only portfolio, I had Aurora, Artemis Alpha, Lowland, Law Debenture and um, Fidelity Special Values were all there, but I've just steadily added to them. And even Henderson European Focus, which is more European, I think there's also a story in Europe which is worthy of consideration. And so that's been the main trend um, there. You, you do see a couple of um, uh, new purchases and my, the timing of my purchase of Bailey Gifford China as was frankly appalling. Um, <laughs> it was just, it shows you I'm hopeless at timing markets. Um, but the reason I got Bailey Gifford China, and actually I've got in the income portfolio, the JP Morgan China Fund, which pays a dividend from, from capital as well, is just that I felt, um, you know, the, the Chinese, if you stand back and take a longer view, and I try and do that as best I can, I think, um, China has now reached the stage where having a dedicated China fund, rather than getting exposure to China via an emerging markets fund or a global fund, um, because of the size of the capital markets there, the size of the economy, the depth of the markets um, merits, and, and, and they're both small holdings, just 1% positions in the income and growth portfolio. So they're both although they've both performed absolutely dreadfully in the last three or four months, I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to hang on there because I think in the longer run, um, some of the, the holdings they're exposed to, which are typically, you know, technology orientated, are very interesting indeed. But they've been on the wrong end of the regulatory moves from the Chinese government. So um, in the short term, um, you know, I am a holder no more than that. But I do think if you took, were to take a five or 10 year view, you really would want some exposure to, to you know, to this market. Beyond, um, beyond those two, have you got much more in emerging market type investments? Um, I, I've got a few. I've got a holding in the Mobius Investment Trust, which I bought at launch three years ago. And that one is performing really strongly. That's small and mid caps across the emerging market universe. Um, so some in Asia, but also um, Latin America and, and even some in um, Russia and Turkey and, and the likes. So and it's an extremely strong team there. But I've also got other um, emerging market funds actually in the income portfolio too. JP Morgan Emerging Markets Fund and the Jupiter Emerging and Frontiers Income Fund. And from an income perspective, they've done reasonably well. Um, and actually, because they have an income mandate, they will not have had some of the Chinese technology companies that have performed poorly recently, like Tencent and Alibaba and the likes, because they don't pay dividends. Um, so I do think in the long run also, there is a good story there, and I'm quite happy to hold them. You've got Dish Online on there. Um, what about infrastructure generally do you, do you hold anything other infrastructure firms um yes i have and um I, I, I mean digital nine i like and i bought some ipo and then i bought some more in the first c share offering um so, so I, I i like that one but i've got some other infrastructure holdings and i've had 3i infrastructure which i think is a great company and has some fantastic returns i've had that for many years and I think the management team in charge of that now are outstanding. It does well from an income perspective. It's got a three, three and a half percent yield growing between five and 10 percent. Um, but 
funnily enough, the capital growth that they've managed to um, generate from 3 i infrastructure has been very impressive. So I've got that one. And I mean, I've got some, I've got a renewables fund, um, renewables infrastructure group, mm -hmm. um, mainly for the dividend income, but also because I think it's got some prospects for, for capital growth too. Um, but yeah, I, I like him. I'm always looking, there's new funds coming all the time. Um, and Digital Nine, which is subsea fibers mainly, I think is a very interesting proposition too, James. Okay, cool. How do you um, think about discounts when you're buying things? Is it something that you're factoring in when, you, when you're looking at funds? Uh, yeah, I always look at um, discounts. And I mean, ideally, you want to buy something um, that, you know, you like, you, you like the portfolio, the manager, all that sort of stuff. If you can get it at a wide discount, even better. Um, but I don't let that be the sole dominant factor because I think you can, uh, you can sometimes get into to problems there. And so if I come across a really strong um, trust that I want to get exposed to in whatever area of geographic or sector wide, but it's, it's selling, you know, at a narrow discount or even at par, um, I, I would go ahead and, um, and, and, and purchase that. I'm not going to purchase something that's on a massive premium because I have to be honest with you, uh, I don't think that's sustainable in the long run. But give you a couple of examples. Bailey Gifford China, I, I took in a placing and I've been watching that for about six or nine months since Bailey Gifford got that mandate. And it was selling at sort of 25, 30% premiums. And however much you may like Bailey Gifford or you may like China, that is just not sustainable. And we ended up um, uh, getting a hold of it at a small premium. I can't remember the exact, I'm gonna say three or 4% in the placing. And so uh, a bit of patience there. But the other one you see a bought Shahalian fund. Yeah. Um, which is a, a private equity fund, and it's again Bailey Gifford. I mean, that has been selling at an enormous premium, um, but it had a C share offering um, at, a, you know, obviously it was just a pound, but it was basically you were buying cash. And um, I, I did take some shares in that. Now it will take a while um, for it to get fully invested. Um, it's currently um, selling at 125 or a dollar 25. It's priced in dollars, and of course, initially it was just in cash. I think they have got some investments now. So, but it's actually at a big premium. Having said that, if you were wanting me to identify one fund that you'd hold for 10 years plus, I think it would probably be that one, because I think there are some very interesting companies going to come into that portfolio. And I just wanted to get exposed to it for hopefully decent performance in the long run. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, generally, are you sort of concerned about levels of markets? Is, is there anything that you'd, you'd do if you were um, in terms of would you raise cash in the portfolio or just change the mix of investments? Yeah, yes, I, I, I would if I felt, um, you know, quite concerned and and actually, it wouldn't surprise me if, say, between now and the end of the year, we, we, we had a volatile phase and markets fell, I don't know, 5% or quite sharply because particularly America is highly valued and um, some other f um, markets also, less so in the UK, but we would get caught up with that too. And, you know, with talk about, um, you know, the reduction in quantitative easing, and then ultimately um, a increases in interest rates, um, you might find a reaction in equity markets. And um, I don't think we're headed for a, a bear market because just now you've got really strong um, profits and earnings growth from the corporate sector. And it's unlikely in that scenario, that's going on for the rest of this year and probably into next year, my feeling. And so I think that's quite a good backdrop to markets. Um, but I think we've had quite good gains this year. It wouldn't surprise me if between now and Christmas, 
it, you know, there wasn't much headway made. In fact, you lost some and then you gained some. I think we'll trade around current levels. Um, and then let's see where we are for 2022. A couple of sort of structural questions again. So first, um, how do you cope with gearing um, in terms of the, the fund structure? And then secondly, is there a, a problem if the growth portfolio gets too big relative to the income portfolio? Well, the, the, um, I do have some gearing, um, James. I have none in the growth portfolio. And, and the reason there is that, you know, I've got some quite high beta trusts in there. And, um, and some of them have gearing, like, say, Scottish Mortgage, which is a case in point. And so to put gearing in the growth portfolio on top of, um, you, you know, quite a punchy, portfolio, some of which is geared anyway, um, uh, is, is just kind of t too risky from my perspective. The income portfolio does have some gearing. It's got £7 million of gearing on a £75 million portfolio. Um, but the gearing there is not really done for capital growth reasons. Um, I've got a number of um, alternatives in the portfolio. Um, and by that, I mean investment trusts not investing in equity markets. So it may be a renewables trust. It might be um, a specialist property trust in, um, you know, care homes or social housing. Could be digital nine infrastructure, supermarket income, REIT. These are some of the names that I've got there. And they all have quite high dividend yields and most of them with a bit of growth as well. And so what I did was we, we borrowed some money from um, the Royal Bank of Scotland and um, invested in a small portfolio of um, alternatives, um, trying not to you know, be too risky because hopefully these funds are very stable with slightly growing NAVs. But from a revenue perspective, if you're investing in trusts with a five or six percent dividend yield and the borrowing is only costing you just less than two percent, then that's very helpful for our revenue account and ultimately for the dividend prospects of the um, income portfolio. So um, that's where I've got some gearing and I'm relatively relaxed about it there. Um do you think about ESG when you're um, selecting investments? Well, it, it yes is the answer. It's, it's, it's coming up more and more and, and rightfully so. Um, not quite so easy for a fund of investment trusts. So we, we're currently working on that just now. Um, you'll probably be aware that um, on the AIC website, um, individual trusts, that, that there is a, a set where they um, can put up for people to view their ESG policies and, and we're starting to look at that and obviously invest in trusts that try and adopt some a sensible approach to, to ESG policies, particularly environmental and social. The G side, the governance side, we've been um, quite hot on for a number of years now and within BMO <coughs> there is um, uh, you, you, you know we, we vote on every single resolution of every single trust and particularly you know it used to be um, you often had problems with directors director tenure being on the board for too long and so we would vote against chairman or audit committee chairman whatever um, and that happened quite a bit, actually. Curiously, it's happened much less in the last year or two. So you think that boards of trusts have finally got the message. And um, so the G part of it has been part of our policy for quite a number of years. And we're beginning to get more. And of course, I do have certain holdings. You saw in the top 10 in the growth portfolio impacts environmental markets. Mm -hmm. I've had that for a number of years. And boy, that's been a, a top performer. Um, so, yes, I think this is a, you know, a long term trend that you need to get on top of and, and be in favour of. Um, 
we're going to run out of time, I think. There's a, there's a question just popped up about Civitas. Um, yep. That's uh, taken a little tumble recently. What's your view on that? Well, it, it has done, and it's um, it's been disappointing um, in, in that respect. Uh, I have to say, over the year, the reason I own Civitax is primarily for the dividend, because it's got an above average dividend and the dividend growth. They actually increased it a wee bit recently. Um, so, uh, you know, the underlying fundamentals appear to be doing quite well. But there is no doubt that the, the management team um, did blot their copybook with, um, you know, wh which as some short sellers have alighted upon, where they didn't disclose um, when Civitas bought um, a small company which had um, some social housing, but also did the operating side. So that's um, actually the running of the homes as well. And they separated out the property side from the operating business. And the operating business was then bought by a company called Envivo, which two of the Civitas managers were shareholders in. Um, and that wasn't disclosed to Civitas shareholders. And I think um, that's probably a wrong move yeah. by the Civitas management. And I think that's been behind a lot of the volatility you've seen in the share price. Um, so I'm going to see the Civitas um, managers next week and I'll be discussing that with them and I'll make my decision after that. But in, in the longer run, I think there, you know, there's a huge demand for social housing. So let's not get away from that. The fundamentals are extremely positive. You're seeing new issues come into the area. And so um, I hope it's more of a shorter term management issue that they will correct yeah fair enough fingers crossed and um, just being negative um we didn't actually answer the question so um does it matter the the, the relative size of the two portfolios the income and the growth portfolio? sorry that I, I i didn't i didn't answer that um, yeah so james when when i mean the, the answer is it could do in 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 certain circumstances and i'll explain when we listed um, in 2008, it was a, about 40 million, and they were roughly both the same size. As we as we stand today, the the income portfolio is about 75 million, and the growth portfolio is about 110 million. Um, and uh, you know I, that's because the growth portfolio has had some fantastic returns in recent years. Now, where it could become an issue is actually if the income portfolio was massively bigger than the growth portfolio. And then the benefit of the income transfer would be relatively much less because the growth portfolio, which only yields one, would be a fraction of the income portfolio's size. Actually, it's the reverse at the moment. I mean, if you'd been asking me this in 2008-9, um, I thought nobody would really like a growth portfolio, um, but they might like an, an income portfolio. And so I suspected the income portfolio would grow much bigger. It did in the first two or three years, but obviously in recent years, the growth portfolio has come back strongly. So at the moment, it doesn't actually matter. And it would only be if the growth portfolio wasn't 110 million, but was 20 million that it could have an impact on the the dividend of the income portfolio. But that's, we're some way from that, thankfully. Okay, cool. A perennial question. Um, do you have investment in the trust? And if you do, which, which of the portfolios are you invested in? Well, the, the, the answer is yes. It's, I've only got two investments in the stock exchange. One is the growth portfolio, the other one is the income portfolio. The same with Mrs. Hewitt and the same with three other uh, young adults who are uh, all related to me in that they're my children. And although um, none of these people think particularly much, I think of the portfolio manager, um, that's all we have. And, I, you know, I save into it regularly. Um, the growth portfolio is slightly bigger because it's performed so much better in recent years. But yes, it's the only ones I have, and I intend to continue with that. Oh, 
Well, thanks very much for that, Peter. I think it's it's a fair, I, th I think it's a great fund actually, and obviously you've done very well. It's a shame, I suppose, that institutional investors, wealth managers, don't look at these things. But um, postponing to buy funds of funds is always hard. It is, and I think you, you know, if you're at a big wealth manager, you would think, well, this is what we do, and so why layer an extra, apparently, an extra level of costs on it? But for individuals, this is a, a genuinely a one-stop shop. And it's kind of customized towards if you want a bit more income or a bit, a bit more growth. And, um, and the one thing I would just like to kind of round up on, you're on the, the, well, the two pages I wanted to look at there, which were the long-term performance. Um, because I did kind of hint there that at some stage I might be taking some money out of you know some of the growth technology trusts um, that that I've got in the port portfolio. Um, it's just worthwhile. I, I did um, a slide um, on the individual stock returns um, that have been the long term winners um, at the last in person AGM we had, which was two years ago. Our we've got an AGM next week actually in London. Um, at the RAC Club ne next Thursday. And I will put this slide up again, just to demonstrate to the shareholders, what are the ones, the trusts that have really delivered the performance. And you can see here, in the case of the growth portfolio, look at when I bought these, they've all been <laughs> holdings for at least 10 years. And the Alliance Technology Trust, I've not bought a share since May 09 and it's made almost 12 times the money. And Polar Cap Technology, now that was bought before the financial crash, so it had a big fall, the same with Scottish Mortgage, and they're both essentially 10 baggers. So what that tells me is that that in the long term, these secular growth trusts is where you will make multiples of money. So, yes, I may top slice Scottish Mortgage or Alliance Technology. I may not, but I certainly will not sell out of them because these are the ones that will generate the returns in the really long term. And it's kind of just a lesson to me, you know, even if we have a very strong value rally and Scottish Mortgage underperforms next year, um, you know, on a five or 10 year view that these are the trusts that will really perform for you if you're an individual holder and so just interesting to look at these numbers yeah very interesting well thank you very much for this Peter. It's really interesting as you say it's um, been really useful um, and we shall uh, follow you with interest and maybe get you back again in a year or two um, i think some of our audience are going to be seeing you at the agm so um <laughs> well let's hope so james and thank you very much indeed cool thank you uh, we will be back next week talking to Tim Creed, who's one of the managers of the Show UK Public Private Fund. He's just the manager of the um, private bit. And they just actually this week put a new manager into the, the public equity side of things. But we also got Andrew Hattie back next week. He'll be talking to us just um, about the big movers and shakers um, over the course of September. Um, and then uh, there's the list, as you've seen it before, but added on the end there, we've now got Richard Pinder, who's the manager of the private equity part of Literacy Capital, and also Rory Bateman from Show British Opportunities, so that's really interesting. Um, and as I flagged before, um, we are just putting together our uh, ESG webinars for um, November. Instead of doing them um, over the course of three weeks, we're going to have three consecutive days. Um, if you can't make all the days, by all means, you can... You can watch them back on the recordings as you can with this thing. So um, thanks very much for your questions today. I'm sorry if you didn't manage to ask all of them um, and I'll see you next week. Thanks, bye-bye.